All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming. My name's Transon, and I'm the head of automation engineering at Notable, where our goal is pretty straightforward. We're here to find better treatments for cancer patients. This is a video of our labs. We're located in the Bay Area in Northern California. And what you're looking at here are some of the robotic work cells that we've developed at Notable to help us run these high throughput screens where we test potential therapies directly on samples from cancer patients. So today I'm gonna to be talking to you about finding flexibility at scale. This is something that we think about a lot as automation engineers. To us, the concept of flexibility at scale is about finding a balance between two different worlds. On the one hand, you have high throughput lab automation, which traditionally works best when you wanna do the same thing a lot of times. And on the other hand, you have the more flexible, lower throughput world of assay development and R&D, which is harder to run at scale because every experiment is just a little bit different. For example, let's take a look at this pretty simple workflow in front of us. You add some cells to a plate. You add 10 microliters of some reagent. Incubate the plate at 37 degrees Celsius for 20 minutes, and then read out fluorescence on a plate reader for the plate. So if this workflow is never going to change, then great, build a work cell, make the robots go through the motions, and you're done. And in fact, for more fleshed out mature assays, that's mostly how things go. But if you're in the early stages of assay development, your workflow will quickly morph from this into something like this. So we've got a few changes here. There's a brand new step in the beginning with a conditional. I want to add a blocking reagent, but only if we're using reagent B later. We've got a modification. Instead of adding 10 microliters, I actually want to add 15 microliters, but only for today. We've got a, a somewhat vague request here. After we add that reagent, I want to tap the plate on a hard surface, but like not too strong, just light or a medium tap, sometimes strong. We have an addition of new steps. After the incubation, I just want to run a few quick steps. It's only about 20 steps. It'll take about three hours. And then finally, we've got some ambiguity here. After the readout, I want to do something with the plate. I don't know what I want to do next, but eh, I'll figure it out when I get in the lab. I'll, I'll know it when I see it. And so this whole workflow is a bit harder to automate. Not so much the set of steps that are hard, it's more the fact that the steps themselves are changing. We have a few changes, for example, dispense 15 microliters instead of 10 microliters. We have new steps, but we don't know if they're going to stay here. Those steps might go away next week. There may be brand new steps next week. There are some sections where we don't even know what the steps are yet. And so this workflow might look a little messy. It may look a little unorganized, because it is. But you know what? This is good. This is all good. We want this. R&D by nature is fluid and flexible. Workflows have to change constantly. It's how we improve. And automation should play a large role here. Automation should help and not hinder this process. So how do you use automation to support this? One trick that we've been using at Notable is breaking down our workflows into small modular blocks of steps, and then constructing our entire workflow on the spot as needed. So here's a screenshot of Green Button Go, which is the robotic scheduler made by Biocero. And for those of you not too familiar with Green Button Go, all you really need to know here is that each column represents a set of steps, and plates run through these steps within a column from top to bottom. For example, here's a pretty straightforward column the second from the left called destination start. You grab a plate from an incubator, put it into an echo where something's dispensed into it, shake it on a plate shaker, and then put it into a shelf. Now, chances are a plate isn't going to run through every single one of these steps here. Uh, one scientist might want their workflow to look something like this. You run through this second column from the left, and then this other column here, and then move to this other column here, and then finally move the plate to that last column where you run a bunch of steps and then read out the plate on some high content imager. Another scientist might want a workflow kind of similar to this, but maybe they don't need this dispense step in the middle here. And so their workflow looks something like this. Mostly similar, but now we go through this column, 
then we move the plate to this other column, and then we finally move the plate to that last column. Another scientist might want a significantly different workflow that uses a bunch of other new columns, and so on and so forth. The idea here is that we've created these building blocks, these Legos in a sense, that then get assembled on the spot to run whatever sets of steps a scientist wants to execute their assay. The overall canvas here is the same, but different plates take different paths through that canvas from beginning to end. But this is sort of the end state, right? So how do you work your way up to this state? If you're in the early stages of an assay, how do you know what your building blocks should look like? How do you, I mean, even know what building blocks you need? So to help answer that question, let's talk about how we approached this problem at Notable. When it was time for us to build a new screening work cell, and this one was going to be our R&D work cell, we took the lessons learned from our previous build-outs and decided to develop this one in phases. So the five steps that you see here are all pretty typical steps for developing really any system. You gather the requirements. What does this thing need to do? You design the system. You build it. You implement it. Once you're done, you verify it. Does the system actually do everything that it needs to do? Then you launch it and then maintain it. You keep a close eye on it, see if there are any issues, and fix it, and make sure it keeps working. Now, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with these steps, but things can get tricky if you have a difference in development timescales. If your goal at the end of this cycle is to create a shiny, fully automated work cell that does everything you need it to, well, that could take, let's say, three months. And three months is kind of long in R&D. A lot can change. You're going to run into a few problems. In fact, by the time you've built that work cell, chances are the original reason you've built it for may not even exist anymore. And so what we wanted to do when we were building our R&D work cell was to shorten this cycle to the span of weeks, develop small, automatable chunks at a time, continuously deploy those chunks in lab, and work closely with our scientists to figure out the next cycle. So we started out with what you might call a manual work cell. And this is pretty similar to what you'll see in a benchtop lab without any automation. You've got a few instruments sitting here. They're not talking to each other at all. And scientists in the lab have to deal with each instrument completely on their own using their own respective software. The first step where we get involved is what we call a sneakerware work cell. Physically, nothing's really changed here. The scientist still has to move plates around themselves. But behind the curtain, there's a very important difference. We now have one software layer, one interface, to deal with every instrument. And in our case, that software layer is a combination of our custom-built LIMS, our laboratory information management system, and Green Button Go. So we introduced GBG into the process very early, in fact, before we have any robotics. So this time, when it's time to run the assay, the scientist just has to deal with one interface. Our LIMS and GBG handles coordination with all the instruments, and the scientists in the lab just have to handle moving plates around from instrument to instrument. So there's still no walk-away time here. You still need a person at every single step. But a sneakerware work cell like this is still very helpful because having that one unified software layer takes away a lot of the mental load. You no longer have to think, what wells am I dispensing from? Am I shooting 50 or 20 nanoliters? What voltages do I need on my flow cytometer? That's all encoded into the software already. And so now as a scientist in lab, you just have to worry about moving plates around. Now, as time goes by, we reach what we now call a semi-automated work cell. We've now got a robot arm. It helps move plates around between instruments. And our scientists can now breathe for a bit. They can walk away as the work cell handles portions of the process but we're not fully automated here. In this phase, we've purposely built in these sorts of pause points, these areas in the assay where the work cell will stop, hand the plate back to a scientist, and then wait for them to do whatever they need to do. So in this phase, the assay is partially handled by robots and still partially handled by people. And there's a lot of good reasons to have a semi-automated work cell here. For example, you may be waiting for instruments to come in, um, especially nowadays in you know, early 2021, um, the lead times for instruments can take three to six months sometimes. And when that happens, you don't want to pause all automation while you're waiting for an instrument. You should automate what you can with what you have now. Another great reason is that you may not know exactly what you want to automate yet, but you do know some steps. So you should automate the steps that you know are going to be set in stone. 
And for the areas where there's ambiguity, leave it open. Let your work cell hand the plates back to the scientists and let them run whatever they want to. And eventually, as time continues to go by, we reach full automation. In this phase, the scientist is just needed at the very beginning to kick off the run, and the work cell automates the assay end to end, so you can walk away for the entire process. Great, we built it, we're done, right? No, of course not. So this is a true story, actually. As soon as we built our R&D work cell to what we thought was quote unquote fully automated, it turns out we had this great new opportunity to run a brand new assay that, of course, none of us anticipated, which wasn't supported in this system at all. But we didn't want to run this completely manually. We still had this automation. We wanted to find a way to leverage the automation that we had. So when things like this happen, the best you can do is just take a step back and go into a semi-automated phase. Again, automate what you can, automate what you know with what you have. So we modified our work cell to automate the steps we were sure of. And in other portions of the assay where we were still figuring it out, we just made the work cell pause, hand the plates back to a scientist, and wait for them. And so this isn't fully walk away, but it's still quite helpful to our scientists because they can use our automation to run this new assay at scale with a pretty short turnaround time with a pretty small cost of requiring people once in a while to intervene at points in the process. And over the years at Notable, we continue to jump between these two phases, from fully automated to semi-automated, back to fully automated, because in our opinion, work cells never really end, because science never ends. The two have to be developed in tandem. So this whole approach of short development cycles and continuous deployment and close collaboration is not a new approach in and of itself. Um, those of you in software may be familiar with agile development. Some of you familiar with the word agile may also reel a bit at the word. It can be a loaded word. There's many ways to interpret what exactly agile means for your company. For us at Notable, it's pretty straightforward. The agile methodology is just a way for us to build things with the understanding that requirements are going to change. In fact, requirements can change frequently. Sometimes requirements just change so much. And we found that in order to bring automation into this rapidly changing environment, we have to closely collaborate with scientists developing the assays. We have to implement these short development cycles. We have to enter these projects anticipating, expecting things to change over time. So to conclude, I've got a few main takeaways. First of all, be agile with your automation. Build things in short iterations and continuously deploy. Check in frequently between everyone involved. Make sure everyone's on the same page so you can figure out what the next iteration is. The, your robots have to co-evolve with your science. One downstream effect of this is that you can use unfinished robots to run unfinished science. As you've seen at Notable, we implement automation very early in the process, before our work cells are done and before our assays are figured out, sometimes before we have any robotics at all, just using software. After all, a broken lever is still a lever. Automate what you know. And just as important, don't automate what you don't know. Assays don't have to be on or off. They don't have to be fully manual or fully automated. You can do something in between. You can create back and forth handoff points between robots and humans. And finally, modularity means reusability. Lego blocks are great. If you can create small, modular, automatable chunks in your software, you're sort of, in a sense, creating a menu and giving them to all your scientists in the lab, letting them choose whatever items they want to that menu to create whatever workflow they want so that you can chain them together on your work cell. So this is a pretty short talk, but hopefully we've shown you a few ways you can intelligently design and build automated systems in your lab to handle flexibility. Thanks a lot for coming.